Wonderland in Amarillo, Texas is an amusement park not many coaster enthusiasts get to. It's a bit off the beaten path. And it really is a shame because this park has a really unique ride lineup with some quirky coasters and rare flat rides. Plus, it has had a very underrated impact on the amusement industry as a whole since it essentially was a testing ground for Hopkins rides. So in this video, I will review Wonderland and explain why it may be worth the detour on your Texas theme park trip. Amarillo is not a place many coaster enthusiasts pass in their travels. The closest amusement parks aren't places enthusiasts prioritize. You have Joyland in Lubbock, Texas just two hours away, Cliff's Amusement Park in Albuquerque four hours away, and Frontier City in Oklahoma City also four hours away. The closest destination park is Six Flags Over Texas, which is five and a half hours away. But this park had always been on my radar because of its odd collection of coasters and non-coasters, so I made quite the detour to squeeze it into one of my 2020 summer trips. I left Frontier City at 1 p.m. and drove four hours west to Wonderland. I then drove overnight to get back to Branson for Silver Dollar City the next day. The drive was long, but my experience at Wonderland was worth it. This is an independent family park. Wonderland opened in 1951, founded by the Rhodes family, and they still own the park to this day. Wonderland is part of Thompson Memorial Park, one of many municipal parks in Amarillo, and I deliberately visited on a Saturday, figuring the park would be the busiest. Normally, you want to avoid crowds, but not with this park. First, three of Wonderland's four coasters have minimum rider requirements. Texas Tornado, the park's signature coaster, requires at least 10 riders, and this was tricky even on a busy Saturday. Sometimes I had to wait a few minutes before enough people came to the station for them to fill a train. Hornet also required at least 10 riders, but that one seemed easier because it had a steadier flow of families all night. Mousetrap front loads the trains, so if you want the back car, which is the best seat, you want that ride to have enough people to fill the whole train. That one is easier since the trains only hold 12 people maximum. The other reason you want to visit on a busier day is because of the park's hours. The park is typically open the first weekend in April through Labor Day. The park is closed every Monday except Memorial Day and Labor Day. When the park is open Tuesdays through Thursdays, they're usually open for just three hours in the evening. That is really short for an amusement park. On Fridays, the park is open three to five hours in the evening, depending if it's summer or non-peak season. So you can see how this could be problematic as you have limited time to experience the park's attractions and you may have to keep waiting for enough people to even ride them. I know a few friends who are lucky to even ride Texas Tornado once. Meanwhile, the park is open for full days most weekends, and with the larger crowds, the minimum rider limits are much less of an issue, and I never really had to wait long for anything. The longest line I saw was 20 minutes for Mousetrap. The park has a few admission options too. You have the option to either purchase a spectator pass for $5, if you're 21 or older, or you can purchase one of two wristband options. You can either purchase a WOW Pass or an Ultimate WOW Pass. A WOW Pass includes every ride except Texas Tornado, the Fantastic Journey Dark Ride, and the Drop of Fear Drop Tower. An Ultimate WOW Pass includes those three rides and Miniature Golf, plus everything on the WOW Pass. You are restricted to just one ride in the Dark Ride though, which is a bummer. If you purchase a Spectator Pass, you have the option to pay per ride. Most rides cost $2, but there are four that cost $4 in Texas Tornado, Drop of Fear, Fantastic Journey, and Shoot the Shoot. Miniature Golf costs $5. The park has a lively atmosphere, and a lot of that is helped by the fact that a majority of the park's hours occur at night when the rides are lit up. The park doesn't offer theming, and a few areas look on par with a carnival, but it is acceptable for the type of park that Wonderland is. The one odd thing is what happened at closing time. Once 10 p.m. hit, almost all the park's lights turned off and the music suddenly stopped. It transformed the park from a bustling, cheery place to feeling like a post-apocalyptic wasteland. I have never been in another park that cut out the lights and the music that abruptly. It was really creepy. The park's staff was on the colder side, but they were efficient, assuming their rides had enough people to load them. I hinted at it earlier, but the Rhodes family had an excellent relationship with Hopkins, 
and it was mutually beneficial for both sides. Wonderland received cheap prototype rides, while Hopkins was able to prove concepts that were immensely profitable for their company moving forwards. Wonderland currently has 8 rides from Hopkins, 7 of which were prototypes in some way. O.D. Hopkins founded Hopkins Engineering in 1962 as a contractor installing ski lifts. Over the next decade, Hopkins started fabricating sky rides for amusement parks, including one for Wonderland in 1976. During that same time period, Aerodynamics developed the log flume, which was taking the amusement industry by storm. Wonderland wanted one for their park, but they couldn't afford the Aero product. So they approached Hopkins in 1979, seeing if they could fabricate an affordable log flume for their park. Hopkins accepted the project and provided the big splash log flume for the 1980 season. This flume is modest in size, and you may even stall out at points. The op actually had to pull my log on the elevated section. But it was the catalyst that caused Hopkins to enter the water ride industry, and the flume was their most successful product with 46 installations worldwide. Hopkins later provided four other prototype water rides for Wonderland, giving this park a rather large collection of water rides for a park of this size. And ultimately, I think that's a smart decision for a park that lacks a water park in a location as hot as Texas. In 1988, Hopkins built their original River Rapids ride for Wonderland in the Rattlesnake River Raft Ride. This ride has barely any rapids, which is a stark contrast to the Intamin versions. Instead, it focuses on sprayers and waterfalls to get riders wet. The later installations by Hopkins would grow to have larger and wilder rapids. Hopkins also provided two tube slides for Wonderland. In 1993, they opened Thunder Jet Racers a rare aqua drag ride. Targeted towards kids, this ride propels two dinghies at a time down a straightaway in a short but soaking race. In 1994, they opened Pipeline Plunge, a wet dry water slide comparable to the ones that Whitewater West popularized. My favorite part of this ride was actually the views that you got of Texas Tornado from the ride platform, but it was an okay slide on par with many of the tube slides at water parks. In 2000, Hopkins built a modified version of their popular Shoot the Chutes ride for Wonderland. Their prior installations had boats with five roads, each holding four people. To save space, Wonderland had Hopkins design a Shoot the Chutes with just four rows, each holding two people. This model wasn't overly popular, but it was reused at a few parks like Rye Playland. And if you want to get soaked, this is your best option at Wonderland. Hopkins also provide another prototype in Skyrider, a monorail that circles the front half of the park. This ride gives some great views of Cyclone, the park's wild mouse coaster. For coaster enthusiasts, they will be most thankful for Texas Tornado. Hopkins was famously approached by the Rhodes family at an industry event, and the initial design for the coaster was scribbled on a cocktail napkin. This helps explain the coaster's bizarre appearance, and it was an exercise in trial and error for Hopkins designing their first roller coaster. But the final product was quite good. I have a separate review in Texas Tornado, but both vertical loops have some powerful positive Gs. And every single pullout seems way too abrupt, so you get some crushing positive Gs there as well. The coaster does crawl at points, which probably explains the minimum rider requirement, and it doesn't offer any airtime, but this 1985 coaster is a smooth and enjoyable ride. Wonderland also has four other roller coasters. Their oldest currently operating coaster is Cyclone, the Myler Wild Mouse. I have a separate review on this one as well, but it's one of the wilder wild mice out there, since it oddly operates with no restraints at all. Not even a seatbelt. This results in some very strong laterals, because there's nothing restricting your movement. Mousetrap is a Pinfari Cyclone. While that may not sound too exciting, this one is a rather large model with a three car train and loose lap bar only trains. So if you ride in the back car, you get some surprising ejector airtime in the first two drops. It caught me off guard, and I talk about it more in a separate review on this coaster. Hornet is another really odd ride. This is a smaller Vacoma coaster that originally operated indoors at both Bob Lowe Island as Nightmare and Six Flags Astro World as Mayan Mindbender. But Hornet was moved outdoors when it was relocated to Wonderland. It's a rather tame ride with a series of slow turns, but it's a great transitional coaster for kids 
working up courage to larger rides. Last but not least, you have Spinosaurus, a SBF Visa spinner. It's unclear if this ride has ever operated yet. It was listed as closed during my 2020 visit due to mechanical issues, but now the park is listing it as a new for 2021 attraction. But whatever the case may be, it's the closest the park has to a kiddie coaster when it does open. One of the biggest surprises for me at Wonderland was Fantastic Journey, a dark ride with a lot of similarities to Wacky Shack at Waldemere, both in terms of the ride system and the aesthetic. The ride was longer than expected, with some interesting backlit scenes, trippy optical illusions, and a very surprising jump scare or two. I was bummed I was restricted to just one ride with a wristband on this cool attraction. Moving on to the flat rides, you have a basic collection of spinning rides, plus three standouts. The park's most intense attraction is the Drop of Fear, a rare adult Moser drop tower. This ride stands 200 feet, or 61 meters tall, and has one of the most intense drops of any drop tower. In terms of intensity, it was on par with the Soaring Eagle drop tower, and then because of the loose over-the-shoulder restraint, you get some nice floater airtime on the way down, plus a strong stomach dropping sensation. The ride did have a really odd loading procedure though. After each ride, the operator would lock the restraints, climb onto the carriage, and yank the cable. If the cable was to their satisfaction, they would then unlock the restraints and load the next guests. I have never seen anything quite like that elsewhere. Texas Intimidator had a lot of downtime the day I visited, but this Moser flipping action arm was a very disorienting flat ride that flings you in every which direction. You get a mix of fast flips and drawn out stalls loaded with hang time. It's a shame I could only ride it once because it was usually closed when I walked by it and it was a really intense ride. The park also has one of the last remaining Hoos Rainbows. This one was operated slower than the others I've ridden at Lake Winnie and Great Escape, so it offered no airtime. It did still have some good laterals though that had me sliding across my seat. For kids, you have an extensive selection of kiddie rides towards the front half of the park. The park's more extreme attractions and a lot of their newer ones are located in the back half of the park. The last attraction to note is the park's mini golf course. It's not just my favorite one I've found inside an amusement park, but it's one of the best mini golf courses I've come across anywhere. This is an old fashioned course with all sorts of moving obstacles. I didn't try any food at Wonderland, but it appeared to be your typical amusement park or fair food. So do I recommend Wonderland? If you're near the Amarillo area, absolutely. You don't have many other options within a day's drive for amusement parks, and the ride lineup at Wonderland really has something for everyone, whether you're big or small, or if you love thrills or non-thrills. What if you're an enthusiast planning a trip to Texas? I think you should prioritize the big three parks in Six Flags Over Texas, Six Flags Fiesta Texas, and SeaWorld San Antonio. But I think Wonderland is the state's fourth best amusement park. It's not the most convenient park to add on a road trip, but I think the unique ride lineup is worth it. It's possible to pair Frontier City and Wonderland on the same day if you spend roughly three to four hours at each park. But honestly, I wouldn't mind having more than three to four hours at this park because there were a lot of unique rides I wanted to keep rewriting. So those are my thoughts on Wonderland, the rarely talked about park in Amarillo that is an enjoyable family park that I'm really glad I visited. The park surprised me. What are your thoughts about this park? Is this a place you want to visit? I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate if you gave it a like and you considered subscribing because there'll be a lot more roller coaster and Spark videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.